Okay, so we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. The last time we finished up at verse 31. And I'm going to pick it up there today, including verse 31 for the context. Reading from the New King James Version, the Gospel of John, chapter 7, 30, verse 31. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is the thing he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Verse 37. On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke this concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. We'll conclude at verse 39 there. And we're, we're drawing closer to the cross. Jesus knows that his last days are close at hand. People are either believing more strongly in him, or they're working really hard to dissuade others from believing in him. Because you know, they knew his words were true, his works were righteous, they could not be defeated. And now they're, these leaders were into the smear campaign against him, as we've seen a little bit before. And uh, today, we see uh, the next level of what they're doing. They're using their civil authority uh, within the temple grounds to attack him. And even so, people see through it, and they're discovering the Messiah. That's how powerful God's word is. In verse 31, it says, Many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Now, the enemies of Jesus actually saw themselves losing this battle. Uh, trying to overcome Jesus' words. And so once again, they double down on their efforts to remove Jesus from the scene. Of course, this thing never happens in our world today. People don't try to take Jesus away, does it? <clears throat> of course it does. You know, there are still today, there are faithful, bold, loving men and women of God that raise their voices and proclaim truth and righteousness, and they can expect to be hated and persecuted. Why? Because no matter how true and compassionate the message that they give, they're going to be seen as tormenting those who refuse to believe. And it will be so to the very end. Uh, during the Great Tribulation, we, we see that God will send two miracle men doing all kinds of incredible things, have incredible powers, and they'll proclaim his message in Jerusalem for 42 months. That's a long time to be standing there and preaching. And when their time is done, God will take the protection away and allow them to be killed. And Revelation 11.10 tells us, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, their dead bodies, make merry, and send gifts to one another. Why? Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, it's not their message of hope, forgiveness, and eternal life that they're, they'll be proclaiming um, that causes people to be tormented. Rather, it's the resistance of the people to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit that causes them that pain. There's an anguish people feel when they are in the process of being convicted by the Holy Spirit, and it just depends on what their response. When the Holy Spirit is drawing someone to follow Jesus, uh, if they fight against it, they refuse to trade in their own selfish and ways and accept the forgiveness from God and the eternal peace from God that he offers, there's an internal pain that's hard to deal with. That's what they say is tormenting them. <clears throat> but until you make that decision to, to believe, 
to trust in, rely on, to totally commit yourself to the Lord, that pain will be there and feel like torment. So the question is for us, should we then not tell people about Jesus? That's not an option for us as believers. And you already know the blessings you've had by simply letting go of sin and letting God have his way in your life. The person that we're sharing with doesn't know that yet. So we have to love them enough and encourage them then to follow Jesus. So our life lesson here is don't be surprised at the enemy's attacks, but remember that winning the battle is worth the pain. Don't be surprised at the enemy's attacks, but remember that winning the battle is worth the pain. Now in our verses we've read, the Pharisees are they're getting worried. They know that people realize that Jesus really is the Messiah. So do they finally decide to follow God and lead the people to fully believing in Jesus? Sadly, no, they don't. Maybe the words of John the Baptizer are, are haunting them. You know, he had said that Jesus must increase and he must decrease. Well, in, in their pride, they didn't want to decrease even to a simple act of honoring God himself who walked among them in the flesh. And worse, they're not even brave enough to stand up and face Jesus themselves. They had no authority of themselves, the Pharisees, and so they convinced the chief priests to send the officers of the temple to go and take him away. Now in doing so, they're just hoping the followers of Jesus would just forget about him. <laughs> You know, would, would the formerly blind man forget that Jesus opened his eyes, made him see? Would the despised Samaritan woman forget that Jesus led her whole town to the real truths of God's word? Would the man who'd been lame for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda now forget that he was able to walk? <laughs> would over 5,000 people, plus their women, plus the children, disregard the fact that they were fed by the true bread from heaven? Well, obviously, this was a futile, futile effort. Looking back at it now, I would have thought at that point it would have seemed that way. But remember God's timing. As the officers came to take him away, Jesus began chatting with them. Verse 33, Jesus, Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little longer, and then I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, for where I am you cannot come. Now, these two verses are packed with a lot of meaning. And some of these guys really understood it. On the surface, Jesus assured his officers that he would go away, but only at the appointed time. And that would be his ascension. He would depart. Not these officers, nor anyone else, would take him away at the present time. You know, someone has said, Satan fills their heart, yet God ties their hands. And, and it's so true here. When Jesus tells the officers, what Jesus tells the officer here displays his triumph and confidence, shows how confident he was that their power that they had was useless. Their arms were you know, figuratively paralyzed and that when he's ready, he will go willingly and freely, but he'll not be dragged by any man. So he's also telling them that they cannot come with him. Now, he's not simply talking about his death. Certainly all of these men will die someday. He's saying that they can't go to heaven and have eternal life in their current state of disbelief. To someone who's been listening, it's actually pretty clear. He says he'll be with them a little longer, then he'll go to the one who sent him, that's our Heavenly Father, and that where he is, they cannot come. And if that's the final state of their heart, that's very sad. But thankfully, God leaves an opportunity open for us as long as we still have breath. But there's even more in those verses. Talk about the future, and, and talking about the future in verse 34, Jesus said, where I am, you cannot come. Okay, he's talking about the future. Where I am. We've talked about Jesus referring to himself as eternal God. The, and the I am, and, and even in the last chapter in John six, he says, I am the bread of life. And six times other, six other times in the book of John. 
He makes such statements, the, the I am statements. He's suddenly doing that here as well. He doesn't say where I am going, where I will be. He says where I am. He is already in eternal life and has been from eternity and will be throughout eternity. I am. And yes, you know, I, I'm curious. I checked in the Greek and it's the same phrase in the Greek used in all those other I am statements that we've reviewed before in our teaching. So when I was in there checking the Greek, I was surprised by another word and the way he's using it here. Many translations of that phrase, where I am, you cannot come, miss a really strong word. That's if I can say it right, dunamé, dunamé. Uh, it means ability or power, like dynamite. It's spelled like dynamite, is what the, the spelling is, looks, looks like. In fact, I checked over 50 different versions in English, and although they were all technically acceptable, saying where I am, you cannot come, or you're not able to come, I think they're also missing uh, some major strength in Jesus' statement here. The words he says are literally, the place I am, you have no power to go. And as so many of the phrases that Jesus uses, this does mean you cannot come, but it also has a stronger meaning. The picture I see here now is these cowardly leaders. They get so upset, they go and find the most powerful people they can to muster, to, to get Jesus out of the picture. And now Jesus is telling them, and I don't know if he's chuckling or not, I'm staying right here for a while. And then I'm going back to where I came from, the Father God in heaven. You won't find me there. You have no power even to go there. How little do we know of, of Jesus' real power? Our life lesson for us today is that the power of Jesus is far beyond what we can understand. The power of Jesus is far beyond what we can understand. I'll let the Lord put into your life what you need to hear from that. Verse 35, then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is the thing he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now, on a quick reading, I thought the Jewish leaders were watching this and they didn't really didn't understand that what Jesus was saying. They were just confused a little bit. But on further study, I realized they did understand. They knew what Jesus is saying. They, they couldn't miss it, but they chose to be ignorant. They chose to act as if they were blind and didn't know what he was saying. I, I think they did this to try to confuse the common people. They acted stupid, looking around, asking people, well, maybe he's going to go out to the Gentiles, the Greeks, where the other Jews had been scattered out to and teach them too. And of course, these holier-than-thou leaders simply couldn't dirty themselves by going among Gentiles, by going there. So it's easy to see where Jesus would have said they were powerless to go there. <laughs> oh, but maybe they were feeling a twinge of guilt, too. After all, Jeru Jerusalem, where they were at, had been established as a great city on a hill that would be a shining light to the entire world. And instead of letting the light shine to the world, they had taken over even the court of the Gentiles to cheat people and to promote their own agendas and their own glory. And another thing, I think there may have been a little bit of fear here. Over the years, they had firmly established religious control over the Jews in Judea. Not quite so much up in the north part of the country, in Galilee, and really not at all in Samaria. So they didn't even go there. But they knew there was no way they could control others outside of their land. They feared that the, the Gentiles beyond their own circle would actually come to know God and to comprehend the message of Jesus. And there's nothing they dreaded more than losing control of what had become their religion. We saw several times that even John said, the feast of the Jews rather than the feast of the Lord, or the Jews' feast, because they had taken it as their own, not in a good way. <laughs> and that's what the major problem was. The leaders had turned the true and righteous ways of the Lord into their own monopoly 
Now it was their religion, and even God was not welcome to be a part of it anymore. And it was almost like they were making fun of Jesus, the idea of Jesus going and being a light to teach God's ways to the Gentiles. And that's something they had refused to do. Don't be like that, okay? Our life lesson is we should embrace God's way. He doesn't embrace ours. Don't think of God's plan as yours to change, okay? We should embrace God's ways. He doesn't embrace ours. Don't think of God's plan as yours to change. Well, when we look at this irony of ironies, little did these leaders know that when they said this, that within one year, just a year, Jesus would not only have been killed as they had wished, but would also have, have risen, ascended back to his father as he told them, and over 10,000 or more of the dispersion, the, the people from all over the place would believe they'd be saved and they begin spreading the good news of Jesus all over the world. Praise God. Now, after these officers had been surprised, they got caught off guard by the words of Jesus to them and the leaders went off on their craziness. I love the way that Jesus responded to the whole situation. Did you see how he responded after that? Crickets. Nothing. No need to respond. He probably just walked away. We don't hear anything more from him until the next verse on the last day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, we were just in the middle of the week. The feast was celebrated for seven days. And then on an eighth day, the eighth day of solemn assembly, it was a day to rest and reflect on the spiritual significance of the seven days that they had this big celebration. So, the eighth day was really, it wasn't as celebratory, but it was also a big day, a very important day. And all through the first seven days, water had been carried from the pool of Siloam. It was poured out at the altar uh, every day. It may have been constantly, I don't know. Uh, but it was there to remind everyone of the God, water that God had miraculously provided for a thirsty Israel in the wilderness in celebration of how God has provided for them in this new land. The eighth day also commemorated the completion of the annual cycle of readings from the Torah, and they called it the rejoicing of the law. Now, the big group, I mean, this, this was the big, big celebration. And when this great congregation is gathered, but it's about to be scattered and dismissed, you know, it's likely that these folks will never again be all together in this world. So if we can say or do anything to help them to heaven, you know, this is the time. So let's look at verse 37. On that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See the picture here? Talk about perfect timing. The people celebrated the harvest, poured out the water. Now they're gathered together, completed the reading of the law. And now he who fulfills it, the perfect one who completes the law, now stands up and gives a great invitation to everyone who comes and believes. Now, I've come across a few people that feel that others don't need to be invited to come to Jesus. That just somehow they'll be saved. But Jesus himself felt it was so important right here. He himself gives an invitation to come to himself and drink of the water along with the promise of comfort and happiness in him. To those who had turned a deaf ear to his teaching maybe earlier in the feast, he will try, he's trying once more to reach them. And if they respond, they shall live, they shall have eternal life. To those who might perhaps never have such an offer made to him, this was the time for them to respond. 2 Corinthians 6.2 tells us actually when the best time to listen and be saved is. It says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now we don't know who might be standing in front of us today that will be in the grave next year, this time. 
You know, Jesus did know that he, for one, would be absent from any more of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, and, and he's a great example for us. So our life lesson for this is that, according to the Bible, the best time to invite someone to come to Jesus for salvation is now. According to the Bible, the best time to invite someone to come to Jesus for salvation is now. The time to invite someone to come to Jesus, tell someone about Jesus, is when they can hear you. The time to invite them to put their trust in Him is that now, it's at the moment you're talking to them. And we learn so much from the examples that Jesus gives us. Again, verse 38, He says, He who believes in Me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, But He spoke this concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in Him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, honestly, I, I thought I was going to get a lot further into the chapter. But there's so much in these verses, I, I'm sorry, I just can't let them slip by. Let's talk about the Pool of Siloam. That's where they went to dip the water during the feast to pour over the altar. Now, this was south of the temple grounds there. Everybody knew about the pool. It was a major water supply for the area. And in fact, when they rediscovered it, uh, you know, last century or a little more than a century ago, uh, it again became the major water supply in, until the, uh, the town grew much, much larger. So now we don't find the name Pool of Siloam in the Hebrew scriptures, but the reference to it is there. 700 years before Christ, we read a footnote in the life of King Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 32.30. It says, This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of the upper Gihon and brought water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all of his works. There's a similar verse in 2 Kings that says, it talks about the pool that it came into. Now, this tunnel of Hezekiah this winding tunnel was carved through about a half a kilometer of rock and directs water from the Gion Spring into the pool that Hezekiah made, now called Siloam. The Hebrew name Gihon is derived from a verb meaning to gush forth. Because the spring was not a constant trickle like most of the springs we see, apparently water accumulated in sort of a well behind the opening of the spring and when it was full and couldn't hold all the water, suddenly it would literally gush out, making rivers of water flowing. You see, you understand what Jesus is saying here? He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now that would be an odd picture indeed if you didn't understand all that. <laughs> it reminds me of, of you know, someone standing there with rivers of, of water running out of their chest cavity. Uh, but it does remind me of the, what Jesus told the woman of Samaria in verse, uh, John 4, verses 10 and 14. He says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living, living water. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now, it just doesn't make a lot of sense in the physical. But hold on just a moment. I'm going to run test here. Did you notice I left out a, fro a small phrase from the text? Jesus said, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What scripture is he talking about? The people there, I believe, knew. And there are several. Actually, let's, let's start with Zechariah 13, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Then Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The water it's talking about, the living water provides salvation. In Isaiah 44, 3 it says, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Now I'll tell you what, Isaiah 44, it's a great chapter to read for further study. And just as the people that week had been pouring water out on the altars, this living water is being offered by Jesus to be poured out on all of Israel, not just 
kings like David and, and the prophets who occasionally went before. These same waters of Siloam, coming from the Gihon Spring, were used to anoint the kings in the house of David. People understood anointing was symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon an individual. And so the living waters of Siloam had become associated with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So now God's plan becomes even clearer. Jesus is offering that living water that God promised to pour out. That living water not only flows over a person, but as God fills you with the Holy Spirit, it builds up inside and it gushes out, just as pictured by the Gihon Springs. The outflowing of the Holy Spirit to, to others brings salvation to them as well. So let's look at the process. Come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, and we know that he taught over and over that believing in him brings eternal life. Then, out of the believer's heart will flow living water. That living water, the Holy Spirit, flows to all of those around and can bring salvation to them as they believe also. It's a great picture. And it's a great reality in our lives. Our life lesson, come, believe, and let the Holy Spirit flow through you. Come, believe, and let the Holy Spirit flow through you. But as they say, but wait, there's even more. <laughs> Zechariah 14:8 prophesies, and in that day it shall be living, it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. Both in summer and winter it shall occur. In other words, the Holy Spirit's work through us is not something that just happens one time in one place. It's something that flows all around us in every season of the year. And that's awesome. I, I felt we need to just touch in a few more things that the scriptures say about, about this, uh, about the Holy Spirit, some important questions. So who receives the living water, the Holy Spirit? What we see here, believers. And not just someone who believes that he exists or believes he's God or, or believes that he does miraculous signs. We've covered what belief involves in past teachings. A believer really trusts in, clings to, relies upon, and is committed to Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. Now, why do they receive this living water? Jesus said in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Power to be witnesses of Jesus. Plain and simple. Now there are gifts given by the Holy Spirit. There is fruit in the lives of believers from the Holy Spirit. There's guidance and comfort and peace and teaching all brought by the Holy Spirit. But the primary work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is to be a witness to Jesus. So, why do we sometimes not seem to manifest that power or not see that power in every believer's life? In a word, quenching. Once the Holy Spirit was given to every believer, literally every believer was and is empowered to be a prophet. Okay, now don't get all freaked out or confused by this. Prophecy is simply speaking the words of God to someone else or telling people the word of God. Now, understanding this, part of our answer to this question, why people don't seem to manifest the power, is found in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, where the Amplified Bible tells us, for the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The prophecy is under the speaker's control and he can stop speaking. That applies to all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And prophecy is one of them. Thus, if the prophet, the believer that the Holy Spirit lives in, has the word of God in him, and the Holy Spirit gives him that power and the prompting to speak that word, the believer can still refuse to speak. I won't say that I've never done that. Okay? I'm guilty. I have quenched the Spirit. I have not talked when the Spirit has prompted me to. But we need to trust in Jesus. We need to trust in the Holy Spirit to provide the words to speak on God's behalf and provide the timing for that. 
For instance, if God may give us a word to speak, when it hits our mind, sometimes we just don't blurt it out to interrupt something else, but we wait for God's perfect timing for that. God is not the author of confusion. And the same chapter also tells us that things must be done appropriately in an orderly manner. But if we totally refuse to speak God's word at the time, time that we're prompted by the Holy Spirit, that can become a problem. It's called quenching the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Now, just to cover it really good, synonyms for quench include extinguish, snuff out, smother, douse. So don't do that to the Spirit. Synonyms for despise include shun, disrespect, look down on, and shrink from. You see the picture here? When a believer shrinks away from giving others the word of God that God has been given, that has been given to them, or when they smother the sparks of fire the Holy Spirit puts within them, that's quenching the working of the Holy Spirit. He cannot manifest himself in their life. The Holy Spirit is strong and he's powerful, yes, but he's also a gentleman. He will not force you to do his will against your will. But if you're willing and you want the fullness of the Holy Spirit back in your life, he's also willing to refill you. We've all heard the verse in Luke eleven ten 10 that says, For everyone who asks and he receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. But do we read a little further to find out specifically what Jesus is talking about here? In verse 13, he clearly tells us, How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's what he's talking about. Someone asked, do we have to be refilled with the Holy Spirit? Well, you know, I think the terminology of living water here is a great one. We need to be refilled because we leak. <laughs> uh, even when you are completely following the leading of the Holy Spirit we need him to constantly refill us as that living water is flowing out of us into the lives of others to be a healthy adult guys, ladies remember you have to consume about a half a gallon of water at least each day to stay hydrated and to, to provide health how much more do we need the Holy Spirit of God, the living water of God to fill us every day to maintain and grow in our spiritual lives. Now, along with the Hebrew Scriptures uh, promises, there was also an admonition in Isaiah 5, I mean 8, 5, and 6 that was fulfilled back in that time, but also serves as good counsel for us today. And it says, Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, My care for the people of Judah is like the gently flowing waters of Shiloa, which is Siloam. But they have rejected it. Now, the pool of Siloam is not mentioned, but it, the waters are mentioned many times in the Old Testament. Again, the Lord spoke to me again and said, My care for the people of Judah is like the gently flowing waters of Shiloa, but they have rejected it. And then it goes on to explain that they'll be overrun by enemy forces because they reject it that living water that God was providing for them. Very sad chapter in Israel's history, caused a lot of issues, a lot of problems, but we have a life lesson for us today. Don't turn down the living water, the Holy Spirit that Jesus offers to all who chose to believe in him. Don't turn down the living water, the Holy Spirit that Jesus offers to all who choose to believe in him. Now, the gospel writer also gives an extra note of explanation as we close today. In our text, in verse 39, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The full treatment of this is something that will come later in Scripture, but I'll give you a quick preview here and then we'll close. Now, John was saying that it wasn't yet time for his glory. It wasn't time for Jesus to shed his blood on the cross for our sins and to rise from the dead and to complete his last few weeks here on earth before he ascended back to his Father. While he was here in person, there was no need for the Holy Spirit to fill believers, as we'll learn and we'll, we'll hear more about later on. But then, once he left the planet and gave the Great Commission, the Holy Spirit was needed in the life of every believer to carry out the mission that Christ has given to every one of us. 
Our final life lessons come from Ephesians 5, 17 to 18, which tells us, Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp that the will of the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that's wickedness, corruption, stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. So our life lesson in a few words is be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, for us, our part is to truly believe then Jesus and the Holy Spirit will bring blessings beyond belief and provide the power we need to do his work and his will. I hope this has been helpful for you today. I know God's words are always helpful for me. And as we close, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you again for being here. God bless you.